Are you thinking about becoming a 501c3 organization and you don't know what you need to do to apply for that? This video is gonna tell you three things you absolutely should know. Let's get into it. Hey y'all, it's Tiffany with Boss on the Budget. I help new and small nonprofits get up and running. You should subscribe to my channel because I drop a video every week where I break down all the complexities of starting a nonprofit. Okay, so today we're gonna to talk about applying for 501c3 status, and that is applying for federal tax exempt status, all right? So I'm gonna share three things you should really know as you begin thinking about applying for 501c3 status so that you follow all the rules and you don't make any mistakes. I also want you to stay to the end of the video because I'm gonna share one thing that trips people up all the time, especially for those who just start their nonprofits and who just get their tax exempt status. There's one thing that they always mess up or they may forget to do and I want you to avoid that. So I'm gonna share that at the end of this video. But before we do that, let's talk about the three things you should know going into the process of applying for 501c3 status. So first of all, just wanna clarify, if you don't know what a 501c3 organization is, watch my video because it will break down what it means and all that, all the definitions and stuff you need to understand. Um, but it's basically you are exempt from federal income tax. And that's a special position to be in. That's a special status to have when you don't have to pay taxes on the income you bring in. So the IRS treats that as a protected status. So they want to guard that status. They wanna make sure that everything is on the up and up so no one's taking advantage of that. So there are definitely lots of rules and regulations that guide how you become a 501c3 and how you maintain that status. So here are three things you should definitely be aware of. First, the difference between the 1023 form and the 1023 easy form. So when you want to apply for 501c3 status, you have to use one of those forms in order to do that. Now the 1023 was the original form. If you watched any of my videos, what do I call it? I call it the OG form. It's the original gangster, right? So it's a long form which acts a lot of information. There are different schedules and things that you have to put in there, financial information from the past and your projections, um, all that kind of stuff that you need to put in the form. That's the form that all nonprofits used to have to fill out until 2014 when the IRS created the 1023 easy form, right? And it really was to help streamline the process because the 1023 is longer and a little bit more complicated and it just takes more time. So it wanted to create a pathway for other organizations to get quickly through to help deal with their backlog, okay? So the 1023EZ is potentially an option for you if you're a smaller organization and if you meet certain requirements. Now, to look at those requirements, you have to pull up the 1023EZ form and in that PDF, in the back of it, there's an eligibility checklist. So you have to just make sure you go through that checklist to see if you're eligible for the easy form. And if you are, you're fine to complete that form. All right. So the 1023 easy is the streamlined version of the original gangster form. The OG form is $600 and the easy form is $275, right? The easy form is a streamlined version of the 1023. That means it's not as many pages and it's a lot less information that you have to fill in. So just do your research to figure out which form makes the most sense for you. One of the main things that the form asks for in terms of your eligibility is whether or not you're gonna make more than 50,000 for the next three years. So if you're projected not to make more than that or bring that much in for each year over the next three years, then you're eligible for the EZ. Now there are other things that you have to check against. That's not the only thing, but that's one of the main kind of factors that the IRS uses, but you also have to fill out the whole sheet, right? So for most of you who are small organizations, that applies to you. So most people use the EZ. So a lot of people ask me, well, Tiffany, what do you think? Should I fill out the 1023 or the 1023 EZ? What's your advice? And I always tell people I can't make that decision for you, but at least fill out the 1023 
because it gives you a sense of the type of information that the IRS is looking for and what they're going to track on an ongoing basis. So a lot of the information that you're putting in your 1023 form is the same information you're going to have to report on an annual basis with your 990 tax form. So it's just a good thing for you to get yourself acclimated to what the IRS expects and what they're looking for. So if they ask for something in this form or they're asking to make sure something was done, pretty much they're going to be checking on an annual basis that that's still in place. One of the best examples of this is your conflict of interest policy. And every year the IRS is going to check in with you to make sure that that policy is being followed. The second thing you should be aware of when you are applying for 501c3 status is the difference between a public charity and a private foundation. So I did another video on this. It was called the number one mistake people make when applying for tax exempt status. And it was around this issue in particular. So if you're a 501c3 organization, there are two designations under that. That is the public charity or private foundation status, right? You are defaulted as a private foundation if you don't indicate to the IRS that you are a public charity. So you have to know what that means. So that video breaks it down, but just very simply for this video, I'm just gonna say public charities typically apply to direct service nonprofits. So if you are doing services directly with the community, you're not necessarily granting money or anything like that, but you are doing the work then you typically would be a public charity. And that means that you're getting a lot of your income from public sources. So there's not a limited number of people providing resources to the organization. You're getting your money from various places and from various people. So you could be getting it from government and individuals and doing some fee for service where people are paying for the work that you do, right? So there are different designations and you can indicate this in the 1023 and the 1023EZ, but you have to know the difference, right? For private foundations, there are different rules for them. And also there are different levels for which people can deduct their taxes if they're giving to you if you're a private foundation. And also you can get your sources of income from one or two people, right? So that your income sources can be small and limited and they don't necessarily have to be public sources of income. So I really, really advise you to research this so you just know for yourself what the difference is because it's important because the IRS is going to check in with you to make sure you still qualify as a public charity. They're going to look at your income and see where it's coming from and making sure that not one person is benefiting or one person is controlling the assets or the revenue of the organization. So just make sure you know the difference when you're applying for your status. The third thing you want to keep in mind when applying for 501c3 status is making sure you have the IRS approved language in your articles of incorporation. So when you are starting a nonprofit, you have to incorporate in the state that you're operating in or whatever state you decide to incorporate in. Okay. So that means that you have to fill out an articles of incorporation form. That's typically what it's called in the state. You go to the secretary of state's office, you fill out the form and you get approval with the state that says you are an official corporation. You are a nonprofit corporation. Okay. So in that articles of incorporation, you need to have certain language in there because the IRS is going to ask you whether or not their approved language exists in your articles of incorporation when you apply for 501c3 status. So you need to make sure before you even get to the IRS doorstep that you have your language in there so you don't have to go back and change and fix anything, okay? So some of the IRS language you should be mindful of, and I'm gonna link a blog post below that actually spells out and also where on the IRS website, it has their own approved language. It gives you language that you can use directly but it's around three things. So first it's around your purposes, making sure you, you're organized for charitable, educational, um, scientific purposes. I'm just doing it off the top of my head, y'all, but you'll see it in the link, um, what it is, right? So you have to make sure that you are organized for charitable purposes, right? The second thing is that you don't exist. You have to declare that you don't exist so that one person or private individuals don't benefit or get shares from the organization. So that has to be written into your articles of incorporation. And the third thing is around dissolution. So when the organization no longer exists and you disband, 
where do your assets and where does your money go when you disband? And so you have to declare that the money will be used for exempt purposes. So all those, those three things need to be captured in your articles of incorporation. And you need to make sure that language is in there so that when you do apply for tax exempt status, that the IRS will be able to approve you because it has the language that it's looking for. Okay. So those are the three things you should be mindful of um, when applying for tax exempt status. So first of all, knowing the difference between 1023 and 1023EZ, knowing the difference between a public charity and a private foundation, and making sure you have the required language. So I promise to share with you at the end of this video the one thing that trips people up and a lot of people make this mistake, especially when they first get their status, is not filing their 990 tax form every year. So basically my advice to you is as soon as you become a nonprofit and that's at the state level, you should be prepared to be filing your 990 tax form every single year. And the reason why you should be doing that is because if you do not, this is the mistake people make. If you do not file your 990 tax form for three years in a row, the IRS will automatically revoke your tax exempt status. Trust me, I have personal experience with this and I've just heard this from so many people who start their organization, right? But then it gets a little shaky, life gets in the way, you don't really do anything with it. And then a couple years later, you return back to it, you haven't really been paying attention and didn't file anything. And then lo and behold, you find out, I don't have my status anymore because the IRS revoked it. So even if you're not doing anything, even if you're not bringing in any money, even if you're not providing any services, file your 990 tax form every single year, okay? Because if you don't do that and you don't file for three years in a row, they're gonna take your status and it's harder, it's not impossible, but you just have to provide a lot of information to get your status back, okay? So if you have any questions for me about starting your nonprofit, don't forget to visit me at www.bossonthebudget.com and I will see you in the next video. Mm -hmm.